James Dean died today, he had lived with a great hunger. film was giant. When it opened more than a year after his death, Hollywood celebrated with the biggest premiere in a decade. James Dean was billed below two other stars, but the night belonged to him. As the picture opened at the first runs in the neighborhoods, everyone came to take a final look and gave him an ovation each time his face appeared. They had made James Dean they wouldn't let him go. To keep him close, they made a legend in his name. From Maine to Manila, from Tokyo to Rome, he seemed to express some of the things they couldn't find the words for. that growing up is pain. They wore what he wore. They walked as he walked. They played the parts they saw him play. And they searched for the answers they thought he was searching for. Some found a kinship they had never known before. Youth mourned itself in the passing of James Dean. Because he died young and belonged to no one, every girl could feel that he belonged to her alone. Because he died violently, every boy could use him as a warning to his parents. If you don't start understanding me, I could go the same way. A hero made of their loneliness. A legend woven from their restlessness, their energy, their despair. What is the hero to do with James Dean? What is the legend to do with his life? To those who made the hero, to those who wove the legend, this picture is dedicated with affection and with hope. If there is an answer, it belongs to them. To separate hero from legend, we must go back to Fairmount, Indiana, the land where he spent his youth. Hollywood newsman once asked whether Fairmount is a quaint little town. Fairmount is little, but it isn't quaint. It's a useful town, used long and well by useful people. Farmers, mostly. One of them told us, It's a pretty good town. Good place for a boy to grow up. 
there are two ways of coming to Fairmount. We came by road. Jimmy Dean came by rail. He was nine years old. The body of his mother was on the same train. It was a lonesome way to come home. For the years of his life, Jimmy looked to this town and the farms around it as his source and his beginning. A quiet land to come home to. A place to replenish himself. The road he traveled that first day became an artery of his life. It lies between cornfields and meadows. Passes close to the Quaker church where he prayed. Passes Mr. Carter's motorcycle shop where he learned about speed and the cemetery with its generations of Winslows and Deans. The road comes at last to the heart of his childhood, the Winslow farm, home of his aunt, Hortense, his uncle Marcus, and his cousin Marky. The farm seemed strange to him at first, and the house seemed very big left by himself to get over his grief. He woke up crying from a nightmare. He was dreaming of his mother. He would always dream of her. Mr. Winslow? Yes? How big a farm have you got? 350 acres. What crops do you grow? Mostly corn and some oats and some hay. And Jimmy was raised here? Yes, came here when he was nine and left when he was 18. Was he much help on the farm? Very good help uh, with machinery and was very good with livestock up to his junior year of high school. When did you first notice his acting talent? Well, I'd say his last year of school. When he spoke in the National Forensic League, he won the National at Peru, Indiana. Then he went on to Longmont, Colorado and spoke in the National there. Have you any idea where his talent came from, Marcus? Well, I couldn't say about that. That's just like two sows, one having seven pigs and one having 15. Why, why does it happen? <laughs> um, what about this house? Is it old? <clears throat> it was built in 1904, and there's about 15 rooms in it. Would you care to go over and meet my wife? I want you to meet my wife, Mrs. Winslow. Mrs. Winslow. Would you tell us why Jimmy came to live with you? Well, his mother died. And uh, we had always thought a lot of Jimmy. And when we learned that uh, his mother would not recover, we asked for him. We have uh, read where he was sort of pushed off onto us. But uh, that is not true. We, um, we wanted him. We were happy to have him. and. Uh, he seemed to be perfectly satisfied. The older generations on the other side of town, Grandma and Grandpa Dean. Look here, what came today? Oh, isn't that beautiful? Where did that come from? Come from Japan. Look here, what came yesterday. I get so much mail from Japan. Have you any of Jimmy's baby pictures, Mrs. Dean? Here's Jimmy when he was two months old. And then here he is again when he was two and a half years old. And here's a picture of him on a pony when uh, he was six years old. Out in Ca he was out in California at that time. And here he is when he was uh, playing in high school, on the high school basketball team. And he uh, does his uh, third year in high school. This is Fairmount High School. His coach said, Jimmy wasn't too coachable. 
You had to be careful about changing his style, and I learned not to embarrass him in front of the other boys. He racked up 40 points in three games. He had been an enormous baby, but for some reason he grew up to be a very little boy. And because he was little, he tried all the harder and made the baseball team and smashed the pole vault record for Grant County and quit. Uncle Marcus said, uh, Jimmy broke 15 pair of eyeglasses just trying to be an athlete. He'd break them as fast as I could get them. Once in a while, he had to bring these home. I was called to see the principal so many times, I almost moved into her office. For the first time, Jimmy began to show another side. He painted the things he saw and tried to put feeling into them. And he succeeded once when he painted his loneliness. But it wasn't enough for him. He felt more at home on the stage where he could pretend to be somebody else. Adeline Knoll was his acting teacher. She coached him in forensics. Miss Knoll, what did Jimmy recite at the state forensic meet? Jimmy chose The Madman Story by Charles Dickens for his reading. What special thing set him apart? Well, uh, Jimmy, as in anything he did, put in his whole heart. He um, uh, had wonderful use of his eyes. Uh, I think his eyes were one of the most effective things uh, that made an impression on the teachers at the meet. He won. I have a picture here of an orchid that Jimmy painted for me. It was the day following the first showing of the junior play. The cast gave me this orchid, or gave me an orchid, and uh, it was the first orchid I'd ever received. Jimmy, who made the presentation then, came over and gave me a kiss. The next day he came into my classroom and asked for the orchid. I didn't know what the child wanted. He took it to the art class and painted this for me, which I have prized through the years. Then he said, now you can keep your orchid forever. It's one of my prized possessions. Mr. Carter, who owns this shop, says, Jimmy was really a pistol. They called him One Speed Dean. One Speed, wide open. Mr. Carter, would you show us Jimmy's motorcycle? Yes, sir, this motorcycle here is the first one he ever owned. This is a 1947 Czech job. It's made in Czechoslovakia. It's rated at a horse and a half horsepower, and it will run approximately 50 miles an hour. How old was he when he got it? Uh, 15. Where did he race his bike? Uh, we had a uh, field adjoining the shop here that uh, we got off the neighbor. We rented it, and we built a small track on it. And Jimmy used to go over there and run around this track, which was absolutely no official track, but just something to play on. He used to broadside it around, and we had a great time with him. He at one time came in here. I had a, a public address system, and uh, he came in here and wanted to know if he could uh, talk on it. And I told him, yes, he could. So he got back in the corner of the shop here and put a speaker outside, and he uh, put on a race, an imaginary race. And he would uh, line the fellows up on the track and tell what kind of motor they were riding and, and uh, tell about the takeoff on them and about somebody broadsliding a little too much in the corner and look out, they're going to fall, and he'd holler and then laugh and say, down he goes. He was really describing the race. And, uh, he really had a, a, a great imagination. Bing Traster owns his own nursery on the south side of town. He and Jimmy had one thing in common a sense of humor. Mr. Traster, have you known the Dean family very long? Yes, I was first acquainted with four generations of the Dean family. Did you know Jimmy Dean? Yeah, I knew Jimmy Dean. He was one of the boys around town and knew them all, of course, naturally. How did Jimmy impress you, Bing? Well, yes, Jimmy had a little something up here that the other boys don't have, or haven't had, or haven't noticed in them. 
Uh, his, uh, the old Dean Homestead is out here a mile and a half south where his father was born and his grandfather also lived there and his boy. I don't know whether his grandfather's born there or not, but the great-grandfather lived there. And uh, when Jimmy kind of get down the dumps, you get the blues, he get on his motorcycle, go out here at the old home place, the old homestead, and meditate a while. It seemed to derive a certain amount of comfort from it, being where the ancestors used to live. And uh, he had spiritual values that uh, the average kid didn't seem to have. Is there anything out there now? Shade trees, a few fruit trees, some weeds that the farms changed hands uh, since the Dean people lived live there. What about Cal Dean? Well, Cal Dean was an auctioneer. He was a farmer to begin with. He went someplace up here about Banco, which is in the northern part of Wabash County, to attend a sale. And the regular auctioneer didn't show up, so they called for volunteers, and Cal volunteered and got up and uh, cried the sale and uh, made a big success. And he was a sale crier from there on. He was Jimmy's grandfather? No, he was Jimmy Dean's great-grandfather. His great-grandfather, a man about my size, a little larger. He's a little more uh, bay window. You think he got his talent from Cal Dean? Well, yes, Jimmy got quite a bit of talent from the uh, Dean family, their old showman. Uh, old Cal Dean, the great-grandfather of Jimmy, he was quite a showman himself. And uh, old Cal Dean had a cousin living at uh, Summerville, that's a town south about five miles. He was also a sale crier. And uh, he was good getting off stories. Some a little off color and get by with them all right, kept the crowd laughing. And Cal could do the same thing. He seemed to derive a certain amount of comfort from it, being where the ancestors used to live. Season after season, Marcus watched him grow and gathered in his harvest. But of all the harvests his farm had grown, the most plentiful were his children, and he looked upon Jimmy as one of them. He seemed like a happy boy, not quite like the others, perhaps, but not so remarkable either. A boy who liked his garden and was proud of the things he grew. A boy who liked to fool around with his little cousin, Marky, who grew up to be his brother. A boy who liked animals because they accepted him as he was. And they were gentle. And who had a dog he named Tuck for reasons of his own. But no boy is exactly what he seems. And Jimmy had his own secret world. He left only three doorways for us to look into it. A tree in an empty landscape, which he turned to in his loneliness. A mother's grave, which he turned to in his questioning and in his dreams. And a clipping he saved to trace the steps of his fulfillment. These are the needs, it says. The need for love and security. The need for creative expression. The need for recognition and self-esteem. He made this statue and he called it Self. But it had no face. It seemed like something happened to Jimmy. He started pulling into himself and didn't share things with us anymore. But maybe that's just growing up. Nothing he tried satisfied his hunger. He began to say goodbye to Fairmount in his childhood. Restlessness possessed him. He must move, move somewhere and motion makes any road seem right. He must find a face for the image he called self. Every block in Los Angeles had more people in it than the whole town of Fairmount and all the farms around it put together. And none of them had ever heard of Jimmy Dean. He could be anything here. He looked down at the city and planned a strategy as he had often looked at a winter field and considered the crops he would grow. Maybe if he behaved like everybody else, he might belong somewhere and become something. 
and he came down the hill. He registered at UCLA, and he began as a model student. He was proud of himself, so he wrote a letter home. Uh, here's a letter I got from uh, Jim Aplin. He was uh, going to school in UCLA out in California. He wrote that he was very busy and working awfully hard, and the semester just ahead was even harder. His grades were fine for a change. Four Bs, one C, and an A. He was taking lots of drama in school, and he had just landed a good part in the student play. And he said to his grandmother that he was really finding out one thing, that an actor must be an intellectual, which takes years to develop. If he was going to conform, he'd do it all the way. So he tried to do it royally and joined Sigma Nu. What's your position, Bob? I'm a president of Sigma Nu fraternity. Uh, I pledged the house in February 1952, and Dean pledged in 50, I think September 1950. Uh, uh, we uh, looked through the files uh, a couple months ago to see whether we had anything uh, from Dean, and this is his pledge application. This is an application to the National in the uh, financial records. We, uh, uh, after his four months of pledging, we noticed that he has a $45 deficit on his house bill, which he never paid, of course. John, when did you meet Jimmy? Uh, I first met uh, Jimmy Dean in the uh, fall of 1950 during rushing, and uh, I was quite impressed with him. I talked to him several times during rushing, and he seemed real sincere, though he was quiet. Well, he pledged, and then uh, it became quite apparent after a couple of weeks that uh, the controls that are exerted over a pledge were a little bit, he just couldn't accept them was the main problem. Things like, oh, missing Monday night meetings. Uh, he had his original, or his final bit of trouble, I guess you would say, and it ended up in a fist fight between him and one of the pledges. And uh, he walked out in a huff, and that was the last uh, anyone ever saw of him. Who am I, he wondered. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be different. I need people, but I keep pushing them away. I've got all this love to give. He took his envy to the beach. He looked at the ocean, and he was jealous of its power. He envied the gulls for having found each other. He envied them their freedom and their solitary flights. Suddenly, he knew that as an actor, he could be the ocean and flood everything with his power. As an actor, he could be a gull and rise higher than any living thing. He would become an actor, really an actor. He would conquer New York and press the theater to his feet. Then he would come back and conquer Hollywood. He would rise so high, he would almost vanish, and everyone would beg him to come back. And he saw a dead bird in the sand and wept for it. But he was on his way. Jimmy Dean was going to be somebody. He needed car fare to get to New York, so he did his first movie. It was filmed on the merry-go-round in Griffith Park, and Jimmy was an extra. A one-minute commercial for a soft drink company. The ride took him all the way to Times Square. The city showed him its nine million faces, and he tried to absorb them all. He found them on subways and in the bars, on the waterfronts, Greenwich Village, in 
places where it wasn't safe to go. He tried to feel what he thought they felt. I love. I belong to someone. I don't belong to anyone. Always the onlooker. Always just outside. He began to push at the walls of his own isolation and break into the lives around him. He would borrow a laugh. A sudden gesture. The droop of sadness. People were his food, and he ate them up hungrily to help him build his actor's face. His appetites were large, but he was never quite full. Neither was his suitcase. He thought sleep was a waste of time, and if he slept, he might miss something. Afraid of his solitude, afraid of his dreams, he prowled through the nights like a hunter. He'd borrow a paper to see what was playing on 42nd Street. And he'd go to three features to stretch out the night. Sometimes he'd register at a small hotel that was left behind when Glamour moved uptown. And when his money ran out, so did he. But he found a second home, Jerry's Bar, where he was always welcome. The gentleman on the left is Louie. He was Jimmy's favorite waiter. The one on the right is Jerry. He owns the place. How was his appetite, Jerry? Always spaghetti. He was a spaghetti boy. He says, I'm going to be an Italian by you. By spaghetti, eat it. He laughed like hell because he thought, he thought he could roll him just like an Italian. I taught him once, and he, he, he followed her again. He followed her again and again. And he just laughed every time I looked at him. He yeah. could roll spaghetti just like he was born in Naples, Italy. Care to comment, Louis? Well, I can just say plenty about him because he used to come in at times, you know, that uh, he didn't have anything. That's when he first started. And he used to ask me or ask the boss, is it all right if I get a plate of spaghetti? And you make good for it? So the boss said, sure, go ahead, give it to him, you know? And so things and so on. Did he ask for anything else? Yes, he did. Many times I'd give him rent money. And he always paid me back. When he made it, he paid good me boy. back. Then he promised me, he says, Louis, says, if I ever get up on top, he says, I'm going to take care of you. Could you tell us about the champagne episode? You mean when he came in with the bottle of champagne that he bought from the outside? Well, he came in that night, he had the champagne wrapped up in a bag, a package, and he told me, he says, Louis, come in with three other boys, and he says, Louis, he says, uh, give me a few glasses here and open a bottle for me. So I said, Jimmy, I said, look, it's against the rules of the house, and I can't do that for you. He said, if I do that for you, I said, I lose my job. Because we carry champagne in here, and you can't bring it in from outside, you know? Just buy it here. Just take that home, would you? In other words, and, uh, and you buy some here, and then you drink it up. So he got so peeved that he opened the bottle, he ran to the beer cooler, and he dumped the whole bottle in the beer cooler. Then after that, he says, well, bring me some champagne. I said, what do you want, a quart, a fifth, or you want splits? He says, bring us two splits. Then he bought two splits, and he says, well, divide it up between us. It was four of them. Did he ever bring his drums? Oh, bongo drums. He used to come in there, you know, for a couple of nights, he used to bring it on his back, he used to carry it on his back, you know, with a strap. Dungarees, you know, and the uh, thing, he looked like uh, nothing, you know? A lot of people used to ask me in the place. They say, who's that boy there? I just say, he goes, boy, you're gonna be a big actor someday. I just say, you're crazy. I said, it's Jimmy Dean, you know? I said, uh, nobody wanted to believe it, you know? So anyway, he came in with the drums and he started rapping the drums, you know? And he was making so much noise that everybody was getting annoyed in the place, you know? So I went over to him, I said, Jimmy, I'm sorry, but you can't do that. And he got peeved again. Yeah, he was a boy that, uh, I don't know, he was hard to understand, you know? It's a wonderful, generous city behind the brick and mortar, Jimmy said. 
And it's full of perceptive, wonderful people. People he wanted to work with. People he wanted to know. People he hoped would respect him one day. Whose names were written in lights. And he wondered how it would feel. Leonard Rosenman was a young composer who later created the music for East of Eden and Rebel Without a Cause. To save expenses, they took an apartment together. It was a five-story walk-up with portholes like a ship. Jimmy called it a wastebasket with walls. If he pressed his head against the window in a certain way and squinted through one eye, he had a grand view of Central Park. It wasn't Indiana, but it was full of trees he could sit under. He began to imagine himself as a deep thinker. An actor must know everything about everything, he said. But in his hurry, he settled for less. He stood still long enough to make friends with a girl. Arlene Sachs. I knew him. Once I told him I loved him, but he pretended he didn't hear. And then he said, you can't love me, and I don't think anyone can yet. We listened to music together, Bartok and Schoenberg and Mozart. He read me The Little Prince. It was his favorite book, because it was about him. He told about a little boy who came from a star where he planted a rose. The boy loved to look at the stars because he had faith that somewhere on one of them, a single rose was hoping he'd come home. Then the little boy died. Well, once he was playing his recorder, he hit a wrong note, and he burst out crying. That made me cry, too. And all of a sudden, he'd do something no one ever thought of doing before. So you'd have to laugh at that. And then I'd see his mind go away and hide somewhere, and I'd ask him what he was thinking. He'd say, I'm thinking of my mother. And I'd say, do you miss her? And he'd say, come on, let's get a hot dog. And we would. I always had the feeling I should open the window and say, fly, bird. He pounded the pavements looking for work. And he wrote letters home. And when he wrote to Aunt Hortense, he always started with, Dear Mom. And he said he felt ashamed to be always needing something. But if she was going to send him a Christmas present anyway, he'd rather have the money. And he wrote to them all and said he could never forget what they'd done for him and that he wanted to repay them by being a big success. And he'd try not to take too long. And he finally made it. Yes, one night, one night, it was a Sunday night. I walked in a place, and Jimmy Dean is, of course, a very stormy night outside. Rain, and Jimmy Dean has got a pair of dangarees and a pair of sneakers, all soaking wet. And he got an open shirt and was a lumberjack. Non shaved, uncombed. He was drinking double scotch. And Jim Louie was serving him. I said, What are you doing? Go to help yourself? Which I was a nice boy. He always took my advice. He says, No, Pop. He says, I'll, I, I got to do something tonight. I want to look very natural. He said, And he was smiling at me. I said, What are you going to do? I told you he was doing something crazy. He says, No, I got to do something a little while that surprised you. So time came. He, he, he got up, he said, look, I'm going to be right back. He set the television at such such station. We set the television, he appeared on G-Man in action. He's a drunken waterfront man. Just the way he got up on my seat. Came back about 20 minutes late. He laughs like hell. He says, now you're going by me a double scotch. You'll have one with me. Is that all right? Jimmy developed a reputation as the most troublesome young actor in New York. When he came to rehearsal, his directors never knew from minute to minute just what he planned to do next. Or if he planned to come at all. An 
actor said, he plays my nephew, and I'm supposed to say you will forgive him if he acts a little strange. But how can I say he acts a little strange when the son of a gun is crazy? Why do I do these things, Jimmy wondered. And he really didn't know. But he wanted more than television and a small building on an unimpressive street drew him again and again. The actor's studio. Lee Strasberg taught here, so did Kazan. To be the best, he had to learn from the best. He would prepare himself. He tried a new experiment. He got a haircut and joined a dance class to get his feet out of the furrows and to find an actor's grace. During this time of preparation, he met a taxi cab driver, Arnie Langer, who became his friend. First time I met Jimmy, uh, he had a date with a girlfriend of mine. Brought her over to meet me. I didn't know he was who he was. He hadn't been in the movies yet. He was on TV, but I drove a hack at night, and I never, I never saw him. So he was just a guy. He came in the house. He was very shy, and uh, didn't impress me. And uh, we went down. We bought some food, which I paid for. <laughs> and uh, we. Uh, Got up the house, we ate. He wasn't included in part of, there was four of us, and he was like out of it. He was always studying people, taking their physical characteristics and using it in his acting. Like uh, the day after, uh, one night after I met him, he told somebody the next day when he went up for, I think it was Battle Cry audition, that he was gonna use something, he was gonna, he was gonna make believe he was Arnie, because, uh, that day, he decided he would take certain things from me. Uh, like, I used to go like this. He would use that. And he, he used objects beautifully. He, he was always, he had a way of diverting attention from other people. Like, uh, somebody else was reading a line, he'd, he'd do something like, uh, you know, like this. And all the way, you know, he'd be looking at that. And he was, that was a, a part of his sensitivity. He felt he was ready to audition for the actor's studio. So he went to see an actress named Chris White. She was trying for the studio, too, and he hoped she might help him. She said... I wrote the scene for our audition, which Jimmy promptly rewrote. We rehearsed for two months, and he never played the scene the same way twice, even the day of the audition. But it was a terrific improvisation, and they let us stay on three minutes longer than anyone else. The letter he wrote home was full of excitement and repetitions. He was proud to announce his membership in the actor's studio, he wrote. It was a great honor to be in a great school full of great people like Marlon Brando and Monty Clift and June Havoc. And he, James Dean, was the youngest to belong. It was great. Lee Strasberg said he was a natural actor, but very shy sensitive about people getting too close to him. And when Strasberg criticized the scene he did, Jimmy walked out of the actor's studio and never performed there again. He was offered a contract for his first Broadway play. Mr. Ross was in charge of press relations for See the Jaguar. Well, um, I'm afraid that Jimmy Dean's first back a fire in the theater wasn't too uh, glorious. The play opened on a Thursday night, I seem to remember, and closed on a Saturday night uh, that same week. The critics didn't like it. The critics didn't understand it. His next performance was in Gide's The Immoralist by Ruth and Augustus Getz. Jimmy was part of an excellent cast. Geraldine Page, Louis Jourdain, and David J. Stewart. He played an Arab boy had to perform a seductive, insinuating dance. 
The Arab boy lived in a date grove on the desert and came between a husband and his wife and destroyed them both. On opening night, the critics greeted him as a brilliant and promising young star. And he remembered the ocean he had envied and the seagull in its flight. And he knew he had found his power. The theater and its people made him welcome. But he fought with the producer and quit the show two weeks after it opened. In New York, he had won the reputation of a rebel. He had denied himself all the things he wanted most. He had denied himself the pleasure of his own success. The respect of people who had been his gods. He had denied himself. Why do I destroy the things I build, he asked. And he sat under a tree in Central Park and wrote a letter to his cousin, Marky, to thank him for some drawings he had sent. But he was really writing to himself. Dear Marky, we asked Marky if he remembered what Jimmy wrote to him. And this is what Marky told us. Jim said he wanted to thank me for my drawings, but he had to warn me about something. He said it's easy to draw pictures of soldiers and people shooting guns and jails where they lock people up. But he said I shouldn't draw these things because they aren't good to draw. He told me that I live on a land that God has blessed with trees and rivers and the ocean and all the animals I see, and houses where people can open the door whenever they want to. He said, these are the things to draw, and all I have to do is look around to see. And Marky told us how Jimmy had ended his letter. These things are harder to draw, because they are harder to grow. My love to you, Marky, Jim. He went up to the Upper Bragg to see Jimmy. Went to California to make pictures. When was the last time you saw him, Louis? I, the last time I saw Jimmy, is uh, when he went to California. He went to Hollywood to make uh, the big picture. You know, that was the last time. And then we had a nice party there for him. A lot of people used to ask me in a place. They say, "Who that boy is?" That's Jimmy Dean. Yeah, he was a boy that, uh, I don't know, he was hard to understand, you know? He was flying to his director, Elia Kazan. When he chose Jimmy for the part in East of Eden, Kazan said, Jimmy was it. He was vengeful. He had a sense of aloneness. He was suspicious. He let you into a private club that had only a few members. Fly, bird, fly. Fly, bird. He had come to the most dangerous battleground of his life. Suspicious of everyone, he took note of possible enemies. The probing eye, the listening ear, the audience. Watch out. They can corrupt you. They can pick you apart and put you back together. They can make you change. He moved into his studio dressing room. He kept a revolver, which made him feel safe. But they found it and took it away. He bought a new motorcycle so he could move fast and alone. He dressed as he always had, because old clothes were familiar things in an unfamiliar place. And he never judged a man by what he wore. But Hollywood did. When he rode
roamed its streets as he had roamed Times Square, Hollywood said, look at those boots. Who does he think he is? Marlon Brando? But the more they criticized, the more he refused to change. He felt that he owned so little, he had to defend it a lot. Possessions were important to him. To be able to buy the things he wanted meant that someone was treating him nicely, even if that someone was only himself. And when a stranger broke his headlight, he cried like a child, as if he were the one who was injured. The Villa Capri reminded him of Jerry's Bar in New York. He felt safe there, because Patsy and Billy were almost like Jerry and Lou. They took him as he was and accepted his suspicion without comment. Well, he used to come in most every night. And uh, he used to come in really after work. And he used to he was dress uh, with overalls. Do I, just to do I see any men working uh, dick ditches. You know, nothing fancy. In fact, I never saw him dressed up good, really. Did he have a sense of humor? Yeah, uh, oh, very much. In fact, sometimes he used to come in the night and sit down uh, on this boot and uh, talk a few words in Italian. He liked to talk Italian, too, you know, a little bit. He tried to learn Italian a little bit. And uh, sometimes we don't have no time. We were so busy, he used to go and eat in the kitchen. And uh, never bought him nothing. This was a really fine man, a fine boy. I think about it. We get most of all the stars in Hollywood, and Jimmy, being here almost every night, used to meet them all here. And he was quite a favorite of these uh, stars. Milton Berle, Sammy Davis Jr. And he tried to believe it when they said they liked him. When he started work on East of Eden, he discovered that a movie actor has to get up earlier than anyone else. He trusted Kazan because Kazan seemed to trust him and allowed him to pace his own performance. They had signals. When Jimmy was ready, he'd whistle. And Kazan knew he could begin. Stand by. Action. William Zinza's review in the New York Herald Tribune was not only a description of his role in East of Eden, but also of Jimmy himself. He wrote, everything about him suggests the lonely, misunderstood 19-year-old. He has the wounded look of an orphan trying to piece together the shabby facts of his heritage. Occasionally he smiles, as if it's some dark joke known only to himself. You sense badness in him, but you also like him. Before Eden was finished, Hollywood knew that James Dean was the most important new star of the year. It gave him the courage to take a chance on himself and to fall in love for the first time. She entered his longing and his life, bringing a depth of compassion and a hopeful, half-remembered tenderness. She quieted his violence, and he felt himself grow still. And for the first time, he found the timid belief that life was possible. He slept through the nights without dreaming. He began to enjoy. He began to share. It made him very happy. And he found a friend. He said, I have one very close friend and I feel so happy. Isn't that strange? Come on, Mick. Lou Bracker lived in a secure home with a real mother and father and three hot meals a day. Come on. Hi, Lou. What's your dog's name? Uh, that's Michalina. She's a uh, three-year-old Labrador. And... Uh... She was about a year old when Jimmy was here. He used to spend a whole summer trying to get her to dive off the board, but she never would do it. She still doesn't, as a matter of fact. Lou invited us inside to show us some of Jimmy's things. Uh, here's a 
box of uh, stuff that Jimmy gave for, to me to keep before he, uh, about two weeks before his accident. It's uh, just personal belongings. Uh, here's a bunch of fan mail that came to him personally and he didn't turn it over to his fan mail service. Here's a uh, couple of uh, snapshots of Jimmy working on his car before the uh, Palm Springs Road Races in 1955, which uh, was his first road race. Here's a guy that wanted to sell him an oil well. Some phone numbers and a diner's club bill. Here's a little write-up uh, after the Palm Springs races. It says, third spot went to young motion picture actor James Dean driving his first race in a Porsche Speedster. Uh, here's a note from uh, his laundry saying that a sheet was damaged and they couldn't launder it. A bank statement with a telephone number on the end of it. Some more telephone numbers. Here's something from the Screen Actors Guild letting him know that his dues are jumping. Telephone number. I don't know how Jimmy ever kept track of his telephone numbers because you never could be quite sure where yours was written. Because it was the way he used to file things, just throw them in a box. And uh, it might surprise you or the audience to know that Jimmy was fantastically interested in business. He uh, himself always wanted to uh, have his own company. As a matter of fact, he wanted to become a director. He felt that um, there was more room for self-expression, certainly more freedom of movement uh, in, in being in direction than in uh, acting. So actually he was learning. Uh, he was learning a little more how to get along with uh, strangers and um, also uh, the things that uh, that he would read about himself hurt him. Uh, he, he would be bothered when someone would say that he was uh, uh, mean and um, uh, disrespectful because actually he wasn't. It was just they took silence to mean that uh, he cared little or nothing for him. They didn't have the insight or didn't care to, to exercise their insight in knowing that he was a shy boy that just didn't know how to approach him, and they didn't make, instead of making an attempt to approach him, they just said, well, they just wrote him off. It seemed that he was always losing the people he cared for most deeply. So it had always been, so it would always be. So be it. He became a night wanderer once again, looking for a place to unload his tenderness and finding none. So he bought a horse and gave it a manger of oats and a measure of love. Lou Bracker has it now. It runs free in Santa Barbara Meadows. He found some relief in racing the Porsche car he bought as a consolation prize to himself. drums. And an occasional people. Glenn Kramer, an actor. Glenn, what happened if no one paid attention to Jimmy? On dates, for instance. Well, uh... uh I don't know too much about his dating. I, I know... One or two of uh, the girls he, he had dated. Lily Cardell, an actress. Where are you from, Lily? I'm from Sweden. I was born in Stockholm. What was he like with you? Well, now and then we could go into a restaurant like uh, Villa Capri, for instance, which was our favorite place to dine. And uh, we could all of a sudden just leave the table and go away without any excuse or anything and move over to some old buddy of his. and start talking about cars or something like that, and be gone for half hour. And he was very, also very moody. He could uh, one minute be uh, deep in thought about something and just snap out of it, and, and the next minute he could be up on the floor dancing, laughing, making some joke of some kind, you know. 
And it was just no, no use of getting mad at him for that kind of thing, because that just didn't do any good. You just had to understand that that was the way he was. That was the way he was. Nick Ray, the director of Rebel Without a Cause, knew what Kazan meant when he said, Jimmy belonged to a private club that had only a few members. And he had his own way of winning the boys' trust. He took him to meet the rebels. So Jimmy could find the reality of young Jim Stark, the character he was about to play. Rebel Without a Cause was a drama of rage. Of a young man suffering and his battle to bring comfort to an outcast boy who needed him, and to a girl who had never known love. He could expose through Jim Stark the things he had to conceal as Jimmy Dean. But when the film was finished, Jim Stark was gone. The performance was over. Success was nothing more than the concealing leaf which covered the tree of his loneliness. And after every job, the tree was bare. And winter returned to chill him. He knew that he could never hide from pain. But if he kept busy, he might forget it. So he threw himself hopefully at each new day and tried to connect with life. He tried to record life with his camera. He became interested in bullfighting because he fancied himself a matador. The solitary figure who brought danger to its knees. To test the limits of life, he had to approach the borders of death. echoes of the thing he never found, the thing which kept escaping him, the thing that had no face. Himself. The star was rushing home. Before he could go any further, he knew he must face himself, and he could only do it in Fairmount. He must know why he found no happiness in his own success. Why he seemed always to lose the ones he loved. A writer friend had spelled out the question for him just the week before. They were having dinner together. No, I can't explain you, but I think I can draw a picture of yourself if you don't get sore. See, that's the thing we all have that we don't want anyone to see. It's very tender, our, our secret self, if you want to call it that. And that's the thing we have to protect. Now, most of us put a wall around it, 
mirrors like this, see? If we don't trust people, we use it to keep them out so they can't hurt us. But you, look what you've got. Mirrors aren't enough for you. You've got to have this, too, a second wall. And it's all covered with thorns and spangles and shockers to dazzle people so they say, boy, he's really a hot apple. Look how interesting he is. Here you meet a director you really respect, and you do some darn fool thing that scares him off. Here you meet a businessman, and you say, gee, I'd like to be a businessman. Here you meet a composer, and you say, man, if there's one thing I want to be, it's a composer. So you're a businessman and a sculptor and a bullfighter and a composer and all those things. But that's not you. You never give anyone a chance to really like you or not like you because you never even let them in to see the first wall. You never say, hey, step right this way and see the real Jimmy Dean. So what's hiding in the middle, Jimmy? Why do you shut people out? Why don't you think you deserve anything? You think you're so dull that if they get inside, they won't find anything and they'll walk out on you? Is that why you run out on them before they get too close? Do you think you're empty, Jimmy? Is that why you're so scared? So Jimmy told his writer friend that the one thing he really wanted to be was a writer. And he flew to Indiana. In Fairmount, he put on his farm clothes and listened to the stories people told. Stories about himself as a boy. And the old feelings came back. The empty feeling of being the outcast. He went back to his old high school. To deserve his success, he had to believe in his talent. But nothing the critics wrote could make him feel he had the right to be called the genius boy that everyone said he was. Maybe if he could discover some talent in his family, he might believe. He made this tape recording secretly. The microphone was hidden in his sleeve, so listen closely. You know, I played a, I played a grandma, and I played a character uh, in the movie East of Eden. His name was Cal. Yeah. And, uh, I read that just before it came out here, the whole story. What I wanted to ask you is, you know, I went by the cemetery, and there's a there's a name out there, you know, my great-granddaddy, and uh, his name Cal Dean. Yeah. And it's so funny, you know, that I played the character Cal, and Cal is your father. So what was he like? Did he have any, uh, did he have any interest in art or anything? No. The artery kind of kid, or what, what kind of guy was he? He's auctioneer, one of the best. He was, he was one of the best auctioneers ever, I've ever had. I've heard hundreds of them. Well, what's it take to be a good auctioneer? Mm -hmm. What's it take to be a good auctioneer? You got to be a good judge of stock. You got to be a judge of human nature. You got to have a talent of it. Well, do a little bit of it. How you doing? Suppose you start with a five dollars on that. You say five, five and a quarter. Who give me five, five and a quarter? How's it go? fill his emptiness. When he looked at Marky, he saw his own childhood gazing back at him. And he could give the boy the same affection he wanted others to give him. What's hiding? 
hiding in the middle, Jimmy? Why do you have to shut people out? Why don't you think you deserve anything? Because I'm bad. She wouldn't have died on me if I hadn't been bad. She would have loved me and taken care of me. If she couldn't love me, nobody can. I've been bad all my life, so I've never deserved anything good. But these feelings belonged in his childhood. As a man, he knew that he had never been bad. His mother had loved him. She died because she had to, and it hadn't been his fault. Once he had dared to look at the past, he was able to lay it away with his nightmares in the attic trunk where it belonged. He looked at the statue he had made, and he saw that the face he was searching for had always been right there. A good face. A nice face. He knew he need no longer be ashamed. Because there was more than emptiness inside. Now it was almost possible to believe what people said of him. And he showed everybody in Giants. Showed them that for all his evil, a man can still contain beauty. Showed them the things he had learned as a boy. How to pace off a field, as his Uncle Marcus had taught him. He could accept his stardom now. It was his right to have it. When he came back to Hollywood, he used his new position to make a traffic safety film for television. How fast will your car go? Oh, an honest mile an hour. Clocked, it'd run about 106, seven. You've won a few races, haven't you? Oh, one or two. Where? Well, I showed pretty good at Palm Springs. I ran a Bakersfield. People say racing is dangerous, but I'll take my chances on the track any day than on a highway. Well, gig, I think I'd better take off. Oh, wait a minute, Jimmy. Um, one more question. Do you have any special advice for the young people who drive? Take it easy driving. The life you might save might be mine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he bought a new car. Jimmy, and uh, I believe it was his mechanic or his other driver were uh, sitting here in the last booth over there, and he was telling me about he's going up to, uh, I don't recall the name of the town. I think it was in Bakersfield or somewhere up in that way for this race. And Carmen, our chef, said, well, Jimmy, we won't see you tomorrow, so I'll make you something to eat. And uh, the following day, I believe it was right. The road to Salinas follows the bottom land. past the hills of the Diablo Range. Giant was finished, and he was allowed to drive again. He was going to race his brand new car. The policeman stopped him once for speeding. in the sun and drink a cup of coffee at a truck line cafe. He felt good. He knew someone would feed his cat while he was gone. He knew his horse was out in comfortable pasture. But he couldn't remember if he had made his bed or left the breakfast dishes in the sink.
Traffic Officer Ronald Nelson of the California Highway Patrol. He reads his actual report, written at the scene of the accident. I received the call at 5.59 p.m. It occurred on US 466 at the intersection of 41, Friday, September the 30th, 1955. It was a sideswipe head-on collision. These are official police photos. There were two persons injured and one killed. Number one injured was Donald Jean Turnipseed, driver of vehicle number one. Number two injured was Rolf Witherick, a passenger in the Dean car. The dead was James Byron Dean. DOA or dead on arrival at the hospital. He returned to his source and his beginnings. A quiet land to come home to. A place to replenish himself. Mark, he said. He came back here about five times. If you want to count this one. The town was silent. The minister said, His brief career was as bright as a meteor which flows like a golden tear down the dark cheeks of night. His poor bearers were his basketball team. Of all the harvests the farm had grown, the most plentiful was the boy himself. What is the summation of this life? the less than 300 months of time it took to spend itself. The 24 Christmas trees it saw. The thousands of mornings it looked out upon. The legacy of art it left and stamped with its own signature. What can we say of him? We can say that he despised the things he was and loved the things he was trying to become. We can say that he left two cherished gifts. He was able to do what few in his generation had done before, to reach into a dark theater and let each person know that they were not alone and he was able to unveil that single quality which most of us conceal, the wonderful sense of our own inexpressible sweetness. He brings us these gifts for the last time in a test which he made for East of Eden. It has never been shown before. Jimmy is deep in the shadows at the start of the scene. Listen. You're the one that Dad loves. He doesn't love me, never has. But this is my son. Aaron, that is, thinks I got a great idea here. And this mother-son cow who saved his money when we were kids and bought him a beautiful jackknife. And you got him a, a, a lousy, mangy little old dog you picked up somewhere. Well, he loved that dog, Aaron. He didn't even say thank you for my jackknife. He'd say nothing. Deserve Dad's love. What I mean is, well, like, who used to be decent to him and, and try to make things halfway pleasant? You did? And, and what have you done? 
exactly ever since I, I can remember. You, you, you growled at him and, and snapped at him. You can't win anybody's love by, by fighting them every minute, Cal. You gotta fight with them. You gotta show them that you're on their side. Why don't you give Dad a chance? Why don't you show him that you love him? How? It's so easy. <laughs> Just tell him. Show him. Why don't you do something for him? trying to find the courage to be tender in my life. I know that violent people are weak people. Only the gentle are ever really strong. Let me be.